Hi, I'm Amanda Deverly, Assistant Curator and Academic Liaison at UConn's William Benton Museum of Art, and I'm thrilled to introduce Tanju Ostemir, whose work is featured in this year's faculty exhibition. Tanju Ostemir is a Turkish filmmaker who writes and directs films that study complexities of human relationships, dreams, memories, and contemporary experiences of life. Tanju received his MFA in Film and Media Art from Emerson College in 2017. He teaches film and video production courses as an assistant professor at the University of Connecticut. He actively continues writing, directing, and producing his films. His short film, Alexander at the End of the World, is premiered at the 42nd Montreal World Film Festival's World Competition Short Film Section after being shortlisted at Berlinale, Cannes Directors Fortnight, Locarno, and TIFF. It was selected to the 50th Nashville Film Festival. His latest short film script, Intentions, is in development at an LA-based production company to be produced in early 2021. Following Tanju's talk, is a Q&A with DMD graduate students, Emma Atkinson and Ryan Quigley. Thanks so much to Tanju, Emma, and Ryan. Action. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, Tanju. Uh, my name is Ryan, and I'm a DMD student major. And um, I watched your film, and thank you for creating it. Oh my God, I was so inspired uh, by so many of the creative choices you made. It was just a pleasure to watch and rewatch. Um, and so I wanted to ask you some questions about your film. Um, the first was the title, Alexander at the End of the World. Mm -hmm. How did you come up with that title? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks so much for your compliments about the film. Uh, first, uh, when I was doing the research about miniature paintings from 13th century to 18th century, actually, like I covered 4,000 uh, miniature paintings, just, and then I picked those five, and one of them was called Alexander at the World's End, but I just liked the Alexander at the End of the World, so that's how I came up with the name, actually just stealing the name from a miniature painting, honestly. Well, and um, for me, you know, it, it was so clear that the art that you chose to feature in the film was specific and personal. Mm -hmm. And then when I got to the end of the film and I saw the credits, I saw like what years the, the, those paintings were published. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it spanned from 1400 to almost 2016, I think was yeah. the other one. And so I was just really interested in like, how the art that you uh, selected for your film, mm -hmm. you know, you know, there were four paintings. How did they end up there? Yeah, great. Actually, there are five. Yeah, it says four oh. in the credit, but we forgot one of them, but it stayed as it is. Actually, we had to fix the title, but uh, the editor didn't do a good job, I guess, in that part, the assistant editor. Anyways, uh, so the, those five uh, miniature paintings, uh, like again, when I was looking at the miniature paintings, I wrote the story first, and then I said, okay, I need miniature paintings. And I uh, scanned uh, more than 4,000 uh, miniature paintings. And the first one, as soon as I saw the first one, I said the one with the cut heads of the animals and also uh, Alexander's, Alexander's uh, lover. And I, as soon as I saw that, I said, okay, this is the miniature painting that I will open the scene. And, and the, the others, others are just, just like in accordance, accordance with, with the story. story. Uh, and the final one, that was the most challenging one. Uh, that was showing the loneliness of a man. Uh, and also the cage and the bird. And I found it in uh, a municipality special series in Istanbul. And I saw the name, uh, like, by the way, I did everything online, all the research online, and then I saw the name, I found him on Facebook or Twitter, I don't remember, and then I just uh, sh shot him an email and sh told him that I would like to use your miniature painting and can I, and I will be using this as the closing uh, miniature painting. And because in the story, the photographer 
is looking for his origin, right? And miniature painting is the path for that since he's a Turkish photographer. So that's why uh, I needed a miniature painting, current miniature painting that will show his progress of switching from photography to miniature painting. So that's actually the short summary of how I picked the uh, miniature paintings. But it was a pain in the neck because there are amazing miniature paintings that I really wanted to use but the problem was film creates itself right and you think that this is a golden miniature painting or a visual that you would like to put into the film but as soon as I put it in the film it didn't fit in so then I said okay I need to kill my darling as Walter Benjamin says and then I had to kill it so yeah and I ended up with the five of them How did you personally you know even discover miniature painting like is there a story from your life uh that you know made you appreciate the artwork mm -hmm. yeah uh yeah again like i i have interest in ottoman uh, and persian uh history and of course i think it's obvious that because i'm a turkish person and i would like to just read about ottoman history especially the art history and <clears throat> yeah, when I was, uh, also I read a book uh, from our Nobel Prize winner, uh, author Orhan Pamuk, uh, My Name is Red. And then one of the, I think, more uh, in, like, beautiful things about miniature paintings, they lack shadow, they lack, pers they lack perspective, and they also like, like the beauty of the characters. They just try to keep it as minimal as possible because the main idea behind miniature paintings was that the god uh, or Allah uh, in uh, Islam is the only creator and he is the only one creates is the best creator so what whatever we do we need to make it as bad as possible or as simple as possible so that we are respecting his creation as we are uh, so that's I think that was the idea that I really like like how can you create an art without I mean I mean abandoning uh, perspective and sh shadows mm -hmm. yeah I mean I could tell just by the selection of the art that uh, there was something behind your reason for picking it and so thanks for uh, sharing that yeah you're um, welcome. you know th that's that's a filmmaker's point of view they have a, a unique look at the world and so like for you to select those four paintings um, five uh, yeah. you know, there's a story there, and so I just wanted to ask it. Great, thank you. Yeah, actually, like, I would like to talk more about this, but we have, I think, half an hour, so I would like to leave <laughs> more space to the questions. Yeah. Hi, Tianju. Um, Hi, my Emma. name is Emma, and I'm a student, a graduate student at the DMD department. Um, so, kind of, you know, jumping off that, um, you know, the paintings that were so central to this, you know, what was your creative process for making the film? Like, what was your starting point or, you know, inspiration? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a great question. Like when, like, uh, as some of you may know, like I uh, called myself as a hoarder, like I hoard everything. Like whenever an idea comes to my mind, I just write it down. And then if I see a place, I just take a picture of it. And when I am like reading an article or looking at, at a painting, I just put it into my creative hoarding. Uh, platform. Uh, it, it is for me OneNote, Microsoft OneNote, and then there are so many things. And I started like, I already had this, like the first idea to make a poetic film. Uh, it like, came to my mind when I, I think it was in 2015. And then I was writing down the specific angles, shots, emotions yeah, uh, in that note, like shot by shot. They were, there was no order in it. I was just putting, putting all, all these, these poetic, poetic, beautiful. beautiful uh, angles and props that uh, could be uh, use inspiring for the film and then when it came to like 2017 I, I decided to make a film I turned this into a film and then I had to go back all these notes it was like I don't know more than 12 pages I guess like line by line and then I had to like choose like to, uh, first I like I had the uh, idea of the story first like I said okay I would like to make a film about a Turkish photographer and who would like to like find his origin especially uh, after uh, he, he his uh, wife passes away 
And actually, I also wanted to add a political perspective onto that too, which is something that I would like to answer maybe closer to the end of the discussion. And then, and I said, okay, I need to go back to these shots and the locations that I noted down. And then I started writing the script. And of course, like when I shot the film, it was like one hour and I had to trim it down to 15 minutes still. So that was the uh, whole process because I, I got all the, I mean, pretty much all the shots that I wanted. But again, as I said before, when you're in the editing room, film creates itself. And you also p need to pay attention to festival circuit as uh, screening time uh, limit too. So that's why we have to limit it to 15. Yeah, that's basically the journey of finding the first idea and then creating the film. So then kind of to follow up with that, um, yeah. one of the one of the reasons why I love this film so much um, is actually because there is no dialogue. And I feel yeah. like, um, you know, that was so much more impactful than mm -hmm. if you had tried to, to create some sort of dialogue. So was that like your intention from the beginning to go with just, you know, music as the main uh, audio? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, absolutely. I, I said I, there will be no dialogue for this one. And because as a filmmaker, I think I really value the image first. Like the image needs to tell the story. And of course, gestures, emotions on the performance needs to tell the story. And I believe that music is not the main uh, driver of the film, but it is just the supporting element. Uh, so that's why I wanted to go full uh, non-dialogue. And but. I always had the idea in my in the back of my mind that I need to pay attention to sound as much as possible. I want to create multiple layers of sounds that will help to tell the story. And when it came to sound, I sorry music, uh, I found a uh, musician and actually like I had specific parts from Bach and Schubert for this piece as an inspiration uh, for the uh, composer. When I talked to her and I said like I these are the specific pieces that I would like to put onto this on top of this film. And I told her, like, can you please just make a 14 minute uh, music, non-stop. And then she spent six months and what we did, uh, like we, I worked with sound designer, like I think 60 hours together next to each other to create all these multiple layers. Because when I was shooting this film, there was no sound. Like we, I didn't record any sound. Everything, mm -hmm. just, just the image was recorded. We recreated every element of sound in sound mixing room then when it came to music i just used one minute music and then the composer was a little bit pissed i totally understand it but again like i don't want music to be i just want music to be the supportive element not the main element of the story and i think we did a great job with sound design and because i work with a real professional sound designer so yeah no dialogue was definitely the idea to shoot this, that's why I didn't even worry about recording the sound because I had to have minimal number of crew. Uh, that was also the other challenge. Like if I had a sound guy on the set, it would be super challenging because we shot this film over the course of five and a half months. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was gonna. Uh, I'll just I'll jump in here from Emma and say, you know, one of the things that. I just like latch on to when you talk about your film is describing it as a poem. And so uh, when I think of poetry, I don't think of it as like something that you just create like in a day, I, it, you know, it's something that like takes so much time. And so the visuals that you chose, um, you know, you kept revisiting places that the main character um, has wanted to go to. And so like, I think of like the opening iconic image of him walking across a lake and us wondering if he's going to fall in. But then I also think of the closing scene where he sees his wife uh, across that same lake. And so I was just curious, you know, how, like production wise, planning that, you know, how do you do that? How do you pull that off? Like, do you know that you're going back to that place in four months once the ice melts? Yeah. Like, how, yeah. do you, how do you uh, execute that kind of filming? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Uh, before, like, whenever I am shooting something, like, I always lock everything 
I mean, locations, I have to go to locations on my own and then take like sample pictures uh, with my DSLR camera and then go home and then find, like, just look at the angles that are useful for me. And absolutely, that lake that was closer to our house was the idea that, because I saw that lake in winter that was like, it, 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 it was frozen. And I said, like, this is a nice place. I mean, like, walking on a frozen lake could be a nice image. But again, it, this was the idea in 2015, like, I mean, like, just three years before the film was shot. Uh, and then I said, okay, I'm going to come back here, and then uh, the first day of the spring, then we will come back here and then get from the same angle as much as possible. And yeah, that was, I think, in terms of locations, like, I don't, uh, I really, like, pay a lot of attention choosing the locations for the films, even if it is a closed uh, or interior scene. Uh, I need to go there, I need to make like some preparations at least, at least like a month before. Uh, for the first scene, like our opening scene, Alexander at the end of the world, uh, uh, miniature painting, that was I think, one of the most challenging ones uh, because I shot everything and I shot the same scene at home uh, with 26 takes, but I didn't like it. So then I had to find a studio, I used Emerson's studio, we locked the studio for a day, and then we put the miniature painting on the wall, and then we put the dolly, all these high, like expensive equipment, and then we did 51 takes to get that uh, without any visual effects. There is no effects. We had to play with this uh, uh, lighting, the camera angle, and I worked with my cinematographer and two other ACs, and yeah, we got that one, I think, in 11 hours. Then, the, I think that 38 take was the one that I was happy with. Uh, that's what I like, like, I am a take-take person, I don't like just five takes, we are done, let's go. Because if you, again, like, are going for a poetic film, everything needs to be as precise as possible. Uh, so that no, like, shaky camera, even, like, a small uh, shaking is, is not, is, is going to break that. A poetic feeling that I was looking for, but again, calling my film as a poem, I think it's a hard thing to say. But it, my aim was try to create a poetic uh, film, but I don't know if it's a poem or not. It, I think it's up to the audience. But thanks for that. Thanks. I would also say that it is, you know, very poetic. Um, like part of the part of the film, like throughout it, I just kept you know, considering more of the concept of time and the loss of time, because um, you had so many great visual references, uh, mm -hmm. whether it be, um, you know, the juxtaposition of that babbling river with the clock that had no hands. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Like, how did you come up with those visuals? Um, <laughs> the process? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, Emma. Uh, that was like uh, very challenging. Because the f original idea was for that river scene, and I went to that uh, river, I think, many times. The original idea was I wanted to have so many uh, clocks on the bottom of the river, and this uh, uh, clock, clock, sorry, pocket watch on top of them. That was the original idea, but I bought nine clocks, tried it, but they were all floating. So then I had to just change the idea to just one pocket watch. That was actually like a lot more uh, challenging. So yeah, then uh, I was doing the film. Like as soon as I saw the Adam and Eve miniature painting, you know, the, the one of them is called Adam and Eve, and then you see Adam and Eve in uh, heaven, and then you also see the snake behind it, and also the peacock. peacock. Yeah, there was also a peacock. A peacock represents the world's beauty, and the snake represents, of course, the devil, in the basic level. And again, like as soon as I saw these paintings and that time, uh, sorry, the clock without hand idea, like I said, I yeah, let's do this timeless. When I was shooting this, there were like there were scenes that you could see other people or other like contemporary uh, houses, uh, even though the shots were like, I think they were really beautiful, but we had to kill those because uh, after. Like, you know, again, like in the editing room, like you, I, I had the idea like try to make it as timeless, as timeless as possible, but I was not paying a lot of attention that I will definitely go for the timelessness for this uh, film. But when, again, like when you get all these things together and I try to put them all together, 
you, again, as I said, maybe f this is the third time, like frame creates itself, right? And then you see that timelessness uh, pattern, and then you start killing these uh, scenes that are breaking that timelessness. Uh, Hüsrev and Shirin are the only two lovers. Actually, Hüsrev and Shirin are very famous uh, lovers in the history, just like Romeo and Juliet. Uh, Adam and Eve, Romeo and Juliet, Hüsrev and Shirin, Ferhat and Shirin also. Like, these are the characters, uh, like lover characters, and also I would like to pay homage to those uh, historical characters too. So that's why I think I want to go with the idea of timelessness for the film. Mm. Yeah, it's almost like uh, for me, I I think there's a version of watching your film where the beginning is a story of grief mm -hmm. and a linear story, mm -hmm. and then um, at the same time, the filmmaker you have put all these shots that completely um, take that viewer out of that completely linear story and mm -hmm. get to experience something cinematic. So I was just, you know, I think of like the shot when we first meet his wife and then he wakes up and enters the frame. Mm -hmm. um, I think of the shot with the uh, needle and the eye, like, you know, just um, really obvious choices by a filmmaker to tell that story. So I was just curious, um, is there one that's your favorite? Uh, in the film? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I think I, uh, like, you know, it is, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, this is a cliche, right? As every filmmaker says, they're like my babies and I cannot pick one of them. Uh, of course, there you always have your favorite uh, kids too. Uh, I only have one kid, but let's skip it this way for this conversation. Uh, I, I really respect Melias, like who is the magician of like he's who is the first magician of filmmaking right and as a filmmaker i think uh playing with uh images blocking is really important and needle scene is one of them that i wanted to play with because it is like three i mean we have foreground middle ground and background and i wanted to fill three of them within this uh shot the needle scene was very challenging uh, because we did, I don't know, 17 takes, I guess. It was very challenging for me. Like, I, I think we spent five hours just to set the way I imagined it because on the paper, everything is easy, right? I just did the storyboard. I gave it to my DP, and then I was just right next to them and then trying to get the shot as good as we can. Actually, there are so many things, like all the props that you see are hiding so many things that you don't need to see in the frame. Uh, and that one, like, uh, I really like that one because it has like so many references, but one of the references that I had uh, specifically for that scene, like in one of Bonial's films, like there's a scene that he cuts the eye of an uh, animal. And that was one of the things I want to pay homage, uh, that putting something into the uh, eye. But mainly, mainly one, one of the references, references was that, that uh, in, in, I, I don't know, know if it's a myth, myth or if it is reality, but I read this, and in the past, uh, in the Ottoman Empire time, like, uh, when they go to war, they, or battle, they also took their artists as if it is an entity, like a valuable entity to the empire, and then if they lose the war, they also give them to the other side, the winning side, with the treasure that they bring themselves, and so, uh, if the artist doesn't want to work with the other em for the other empire, what they do, uh, they what they did actually, they put a needle into the eye, and then after like specific, I mean like 24 hours, they just go blind. Or if the emperor who lost the battle could just put in a needle into his eye so that he will not be useful for the other side. So that was one of the ideas that I wanted to play with. But of course, and the film is also like he's sort of cheating on her even though she passed away so I wanted to like just think about like how can I show anger like to the limits and that was the scene that I wanted to play with that emotion and like because we don't start even though she is just right behind him but we see her uh, on the mirror it was very dangerous for me too because if I would tweak just a little bit the needle could go right into your eye right away so like it was, I, I was saying to my wife like a little bit long, a little bit further, a little bit further because I could see the monitor and she was also freaking out. So like I think that's enough. This is enough. But I was just pushing her. Yeah, that's that was I think one of the most challenging one, but at the same time I think the rewarding ones.
and uh, also the scene with the clock sorry the pocket watch uh, we were actually freezing like my feet were freezing when we were doing that scene because I had to go in the water even though like I had waterproof uh, boots uh, but it, the water managed to find a way to go in the boots and then I was like I think we spent like uh, 45 minutes within the frozen uh, water freezing water sorry and then we tried to get that shot uh, so yeah I think these are the two and also the final one sorry like you know the, the, the babies never end uh, <laughs> the, the final one was very I mean like uh, I really like the final uh, scene angle I mean the atmosphere of the final one because uh, that one I just shot with my wife and I and I just put the camera because the, again like as I said it, uh, we shot this over five, five and a half months and I already knew that it is hard to find people who will be dedicated throughout the process so that's why I had to play the role of uh, a cinematographer too because I'm again like a control freak I, it's very hard for me to give up the camera composition is very important for me so for the final scene uh, I was behind the camera all the time like when I was in front of the camera I just hit the record and I asked my wife can you please just pan this way or that way so that's how we uh, got the final scene I think we did a good job uh, she, she's actually like a great I mean amazing uh, camera assistant honestly so she did a great job too so yeah I think these are the shots that I really like yeah um like you had so many roles in this film being director yes. writer producer yeah. Yeah. cameraman actor how did you end up trying to balance all of those yeah get... that's <laughs> that's like that's super hard honestly uh again as i said like i you never ever want to write and direct and act in front of in within the same film because it is super challenging but uh, but i think once you at the beginning of the process admit that you have to wear these different caps on your head I think it makes it easier because you set the expectation for your psychology as well. But, but actually, there were moments that I had some panic attacks too. That that is, this film is just falling apart. Especially the scene where you see Husrev, the sitel photography that he's getting, the eggs and the fruits. That one, when he that one was very. I mean, at that moment, I remember having a panic attack because. I had to make the production design as well, but thanks to my uh, crew, they uh, actually my wife also as well. Uh, they just set uh, the uh, props the way I imagined it. Actually, I, all, I also had a reference, reference painting, painting for, for that, that scene, scene, and they, they just mimic everything with the new painting. painting. And uh, uh, after like half an hour, when I came back, back I was like, thank, thank you so much. much. Because the trick of filmmaking is. Uh, collaboration. If you're not collaborating, then you are not going to make another film because that is the nature of filmmaking. And I have had, like, uh, actually, I still have friends who tried that way, like one man show or one woman show uh, style filmmaking. It is super hard, and they, like, after two films, they gave up making films. I think I do know that I will, I don't want to. Uh, jinx it, I mean, I will not jinx it, but uh, talk big, you know, what goes around comes around. Uh, I don't uh, want to say it that way, but I never ever want to be an actor and director at the same time. Uh, so it is it is very challenging. That's why like, I am right now, like for my other films, I'm working with a producer and different DPs. I also have my colorists, sound designers. So like I already have my essential crew in my hand. Uh, I can reach them and ask for help, of course, not for free, because, you know, it's not going to help them in the long run. Yeah. Uh, like, I'm comfortable with writing directing, of course, like, I'm writing directing my films, that's what I want to do, but I don't want to act again in front of the camera. For my films, for other people, I can still do that, because some people ask, I, I think I acted in many films, in really weird roles, but yeah, never acting for my films. Totally understandable. <laughs> yeah. My last yeah. question is, um, I feel like, especially your filmmaking style, you took advantage of cuts as narrative. Mm. And usually a cut in a film is, you know, either getting closer towards a scene that, you know, a big action scene, and then we cut closer to the 
character uh, going through it, or we cut wider. Um, but in your film, the the cuts were story. Like mm -hmm. it was the main character suddenly waking up the next day. Mm -hmm. Those kinds of things. So I was just curious, like um, how you chose that visual style. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, again, like everything is uh, was on the paper when I was like writing this story. I was also writing the transitions still because that, like again, uh, I already knew that I was going to uh, go for the uh, poetic style. And if you want to have that poetic style, you know, like when you are reading a poem, the next word is always very important. That as a, as if it is a transition to the next line, right? So that's why I had to think about the transition as well. Like in the opening scene, like we see the head of Alexander, and then we see him uh, on the, on top of the painting, and we see him walking on the ice, and then we cut to uh, again the almost like cut head of the wife as a reference back to the first scene. So these were like all the ideas, and also the scene when we see that fish, like actually even that pen was everything was planned. We actually did many many takes and pouring the uh, Turkish coffee grains in it. Uh, so like that panning was already, I mean everything was planned on the paper. Of course you make uh, so many changes in the editing room too. I call editing room as magic room because once you have everything that you like, I think there are infinite ways of making a film which is overwhelming but at the same time like luxury that you just want to play with it and then try to create this I mean, meaningful film, right? But uh, of course, you need to uh, write down everything, every transition. That was actually my style for this film. So like all and these transitions, everything was written down. Uh, so that's why it was a lot easy to have a smoother transition to the next scene. Uh, otherwise, I don't think that it would work because if you are panning in previous scene, then the camera movement has to match to the next scene, right? so that it will be a smoother transition. So that's why you have to think about every camera movement in relation to the uh, motivation to cut to the next scene. So that's why you have to... I had to think about those things. Otherwise it would not work the way I wanted it. I don't think that I will be doing a film uh, without a dialogue uh, anymore. Uh, so that's why my next film is full of dialogue and then uh, I mean just dialogue driven, that's what I mean. So yeah, filmmaking is always like a process that you learn by experience by shooting more. So mm -hmm. we made so many mistakes uh, and the next one you are a little more experienced but it doesn't mean that uh, the previous success will make your next film successful as well. That is the trick and anxiety of filmmaking. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Tanju. Uh, such a pleasure to uh, see your film and get time to talk with you about it. Yeah, likewise. Thank you so much for these great questions and for this session. Yeah.